Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this lunchtime seminar in February. And as you'll know, we're going to be talking about outstanding governing boards. What makes a board outstanding? Sorry, just delaying because my slides aren't moving on. Sorry about sorry about that. Slight technical hitch there. Um, those of you that have joined us uh, before know that our webinars are very much um, teachings, uh, lectures, and I will absolutely have stopped by the fortieth um, minute. So these aren't uh, the forums where we try and be interactive. Those of you that are members um, will know that we organize a whole host of other uh, events where uh, we do have conversations with you and listen um, to you. Uh, please do um, add any comments um, into the uh, chat uh, and we will try and answer those after the webinar. I certainly won't be able to um, look at those while I'm uh, presenting. You will be sent these slides and links to any resources um, that I mention. Um, this is being recorded and we do make it available on our website. So please feel free um, to share that with other people. And uh, thank you so much uh, for what you do uh, in your capacity for your pupils and your community. Uh, it is um, uh, an important job that uh, you do. And that might not be um, said enough, uh, but actually thinking about this webinar today has really brought that home to me just you know, how much effort really goes into um, making a, a governing board work well, let alone perhaps being labelled um, as outstanding. So the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, today is, so what is the difference between that term good governance, which uh, NGA uses uh, a lot, it's one of our absolute um, staples of, of governance, and, and what that difference with 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 outstanding um, and I'm going to then um, look in a little bit more detail about um, what we're looking for um, in our awards for single schools and federations and then I thought some of you might have registered because you thought I might be talking about Ofsted outstanding which I'm absolutely not except um, to make that comparison and just have a quick look at what does Ofsted think um, is is outstanding um, then I'll look uh, separately at um, what we're expecting for the multi-academy trust category. Um, but I'm not, this really isn't a, a, a tick list through our awards criteria. It's much more a general conversation about um, how can uh, a board be outstanding. So I'm going to finish by looking at um, two uh, particular uh, topics. One, um, practice um, and that I've picked up from the third sector, from the charity sector, that works absolutely as well for schools and governing boards. And, and uh, lastly, um, uh, the, the role the governing board plays in developing a, a healthy a healthy culture. Again, it's so important to the work that you do, and we perhaps don't talk about that um, enough. So our awards um, are um, every two years, that's partly because, or, or entirely because, um, they are really a big deal for us. We do this, I suppose, in true NGA um, fashion, um, in all seriousness and very thoroughly. Um, we absolutely don't want to be giving awards um, to people where we haven't had a chance to talk to them um, about uh, what exactly they're doing. So we do um, carry out not only due diligence, but much more importantly, we will ask people who apply at long list stage for more information if we need it. And then we carry out um, interviews at the shortlisted stage. And I have to say, as somebody who's been involved in those interviews, uh, it's an absolute uh, delight and privilege 
privilege to be part of that um, process. The um, people that we are lucky enough to, to talk to are doing absolutely fabulous things for their trusts and schools. And my guess is so many more of you are, but you don't necessarily think of yourselves in that way. Generally, as a community, I think we're not in the business of saying, hey, look at us. Aren't we marvellous? So I think this is one of the times when we're encouraging you to do that. I hope you're impressed by the fact that um, I am modelling visible governance colours um, here today. NGA very much um, views the awards as part of our visible governance campaign to um, showcase what governing boards do in the schools and trusts sector um, to celebrate that because we don't have enough celebration, particularly in these times when, let's face it, the challenges are quite considerable in many um, uh, places. And then lastly, to share practice. I mean, so often people say it would be really nice to see examples of what other people are, are doing. So this is our, our opportunity um, to, to do that. So I started off by saying good governance is the phrase that we normally uh, talk about at, at NGA. And in fact, um, I did another webinar. Uh, I can't believe it's actually two years ago on what makes for good governance. So that is still there um, on, on our website. Please have a have a look at that um, if, if you haven't um, come across you know, our, our concept of, of good governance um, uh, before. Before. We did debate when we were preparing to launch the 2023 awards whether we should change the name and whether these should be awards for good governance rather than outstanding governance. But unfortunately, because Ofsted's terminology is um, so prevalent in the sector, uh, we thought that this might be perceived as somehow, you know, dumbing down the awards, not being as ambitious for the awards. And we, we couldn't quite think of another word. We did think of, of excellence. But, but that didn't quite encapsulate what we were looking for either. So please feel free to put uh, suggestions in the chat for two years time. What, what should we call these awards if we don't want to look as though we're, we're mirroring um, uh, Ofsted? And largely, what we are asking um, uh, applicants for is very much to demonstrate that they are practicing um, good governance. Um, so those three pillars of, of good governance, being effective, being ethical, being accountable, will absolutely be looking for evidence of that um, in your application. And actually, I probably should have said, first off, we have really tried to streamline the application process this year. So it's a lot easier. It's now it's now digital. You don't have to be sending us in lots of different um, uh, PD, PDFs. Um, and we're only asking for quite small amounts of information at stage one. That's why we have the long listing um, at stage and take people take people through. But I think you would absolutely be expecting us um, to, to see where other, um, uh, people were um, governing in a way that, that we considered to be taking account of effective governance, ethical governance and accountable governance. And then, of course, we've got our four core functions of governing boards, haven't we? So we're also doing a cross check as to how the board is managing with all those uh, four functions. And that first one about clear vision and strategy looks a bit as though I've added more to it because it's my favourite core function. It's not meant to be quite like that, but we have in previous years um, had a separate award and a separate category for vision and strategy because we really wanted to start pushing several years ago um, that core function because we thought it was under talked about um, but but just under under practice that uh, there was a lot of talk about holding executives to account but not very much about vision and strategic thinking I think that's changed over the past decade which is which is great and um, so what we've decided to do this year is instead look at both the single schools and the uh, multi-academy trust applications um, uh, that we have and if there are people who really distinguish themselves on vision and, and strategy to acknowledge 
change that in the way we we make we make awards And then, um, as well as those um, uh, core functions, there'll be other things that um, we would expect a, a, an outstanding board to be conscious of and to be thinking of. So culture, as I said, I'm going to come back to at the end, being visible um, yourselves, uh, modelling um, that uh, in various uh, ways with various audiences, um, obviously visiting schools if you're governing um, in a single school uh, should be just part, part of the everyday um, practice. But I hope that you've been thinking of other ways as, as well in which you can um, uh, spread uh, that understanding of of governance um, across your your community. That third bullet point probably is almost the most important one in this this, this entire session about continual improvement. Um, this absolutely is not about perfection. Um, I, I can't say that enough. It's about um, reflecting on your practice, revising your practice where you need to, and next time coming back, sort of, you know, better, stronger, more, more reflective. I don't think any of us ever um, think we've got to, to, to perfection. And of course, boards change, don't they? And, and we've seen that as well. There have been some cases where governing boards for a period have been incredibly strong um, for a variety of of reasons and then there's change um, and that may lead to um, a, a reduction in various uh, practices that that there needs to be needs to be revived um, so you know don't feel um, that you've got to be marvelous you know every hour of every week because none of us could could possibly um live up to that standard and and i'm so conscious of that in my position because it's so easy for me to spiel all of this out and actually we know how hard it is to govern both within meetings and outside of meetings and working with your your head teacher um or or your executive and I think perhaps sometimes we don't stress that enough because we're trying to uh, model sort of enthusiastic leadership, optimistic leadership. And we don't want everybody to be overwhelmed by what a difficult task this is. But actually, governing is not easy. And I think it's often until people have tried it themselves that they realise just how complex this is, how nuanced, how difficult it is to always get the balance right between different functions or to get the questioning um, uh, uh, right. Um, so, so yes, don't, I, I don't want you to, to, to feel that there is some, you know, pinnacle that you're trying to um, achieve and it, you, you're never quite you never quite get there we would also expect an outstanding um, board to have an outlook outward looking um, approach to seek external views on their own practice, but also more generally on what the school or, or trust um, is doing, that sort of collaboration, um, learning, learning from others, two way um, communications. Clearly, there are some basics that we check, but you know this is the the due diligence bit. But generally, it's not it's not a tick list. But there are some things where we feel actually, if you haven't got one, you know, haven't done this, whether it's a code of conduct or a or a skills audit or a self review, say within within the last twelve months, then then by definition, um, you, you wouldn't meet that sort of outstanding uh, criteria. But generally, this is not a deficit model. What we're looking for is um, boards that are making uh, a difference. So uh, after all, that's what you're all about, isn't it? That's why you're volunteering. So we ask you to um, describe in just 500 words. So you can see when we're not asking for huge essays um, about one and, you know, you won't get penalised if you only choose one or not two significant achievements that you feel your board um, has uh, has has made, um, you know, when it's very much in in leadership mode, what was that? 
you know change that you championed and helped um, develop or that improvement that you championed and 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 help um, develop um, how did you identify this issue um, how did you um, ensure that other people's stakeholders were heard what resources did you need where did you find them from how did you work with your senior leaders um, on on that um, you know a little bit about the discussions you had there's you know that's the other thing actually I should say you know we're never looking um, for a board for whom everything goes swimmingly and you all agree all of the time in fact by definition that probably means there's not enough um, debate, not not enough um, really examining um, different different issues um, going on. So what was the result of that? And that, that sort of so so what um, question. Now, um, it has so happened that some of our finalists in past years have been people who have had a particular project that's made a difference. So in one case, for example, um, it was um, a primary school who began um, an, an early years uh, provision, nursery provision on, on their site. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be something as, you know, physical and obvious as that. But, you know, looking back, I'm really proud of the fact that the first two years I was involved, which is a long time ago now, we actually had um, two winners that had been involved even then um, in environmental sustainability. So it's a little bit about, you know, people being um, ahead uh, ahead of the of of their curve so you can see I mean I think those of you that know NGA and and know me um, uh, know that greener governance has been very much um, on our list of priorities for the last year but we haven't actually put them in our in our criteria um, here we thought that would be a little bit a little bit asking too much but but I do hope um, that outstanding boards would have um, considered uh, the environmental sustainability of their schools um or or trust so what about what about Ofsted and it outstanding. Well, if you look at um, Ofsted's judgment across the piece, the real key thing to being outstanding is is consistency you know consistency across it's a word they use time and time again you can see it underlined there but also in terms of um, actually right across all the criteria that they're expecting you to meet all of the good um, uh, 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 criteria plus some um, uh, additionals however um, when we looked at um, obviously governance, as I'm sure you'll know, comes underneath um, outstanding leadership and management. And when we look to what actually makes that bit outstanding, the it doesn't really add anything to uh, what I've been saying so, so far. And if anything, I think we're more ambitious um, than um, uh, than Ofsted's being specifically in terms of, of governance, because there aren't that many uh, uh, mentions there. But it's interesting, um, I, I, I glossed over earlier the fourth core function of um, strong stakeholder engagement, but it's interesting that that is there in Ofsted's outstanding leadership um, uh, judgment as well, framework um, as as well. So I think the whole sector sort of is coming together uh, behind really emphasizing, um, ensuring that there is uh, engagement um, with your stakeholders. And that may well be something that you have been trying to improve over the years and not, again, not necessarily got to the point where you think, do you know what, we're doing all of this right all of the time because again that's a pretty big ask when you look at the whole range of of stakeholders that a school or trust has but other than that they're also relying on the core functions and they're relying on their on um, fulfilling the statutory duties which by the way we would expect as a you know as a basic rather than um, as an outstanding so just moving on to um, a multi-academy trust. So how is outstanding different there? Well, do you know what? It's not as different as you might have thought 
it would be. And I really did think hard about this. You know, I've got some white space on this slide. I could have added in more. I didn't want to just be reinforcing my own assumptions from many years ago when we started working with trust. But actually, they have held true in that what we expect from governance of single schools in terms of principles works absolutely with multi-academy trusts when you're governing a larger organization responsible for a number of schools. And some of you may, may remember that a long time ago, I had a little catchphrase, um, governance is governance is governance. You know, we learn from other sectors, we learn from other structures, and actually the fundamentals are, are the same. What might differ is the how. Uh, so, uh, for example, with a multi-academy trust talking about engaging stakeholders, the trust board will set the expectations, will set the values, but actually in terms of engagement, often a lot of that will be done by those who are governing at academy level. Similarly, with visibility, yes, you want your trustees absolutely to be visible across the trust, but you might not do it in the same way as with governors at a single school. You, you know, you might not be expecting your your trustees to visit a whole number of schools. That might not be feasible if it's a very a very large trust. So it's that that principle of engaging with stakeholders, that principle of visibility, rather than doing it in the in the in the same way, and that's been the challenge for. Mats as they've grown and developed and formed over the last um, uh, 12 years and 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 more, in fact, for 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 some to develop those ways of doing it well, which leads me beautifully onto that next point about meaningful local governance arrangements. If we were having this, um, I was about to say discussion, it's not exactly a two-way discussion today, but if we were talking about the issue of local governance six, seven years ago, the jury might have been out a little bit. It hadn't been around long enough to really prove its worth. Uh, but actually, now we know exactly the benefits that local governance within a map so that by that I mean, you know, governing at academy level or for, for a couple of academies adds to the trust governance um, as a whole. So we would expect, we would expect this actually in any trust, but absolutely in an outstanding trust that everybody who's governing at every level understands that trust is one organisation. And that's why we look at how it's governed as a whole. But every committee and every tier understands um, its its role vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the, the others and understands it and believes it to be meaningful and useful. After all, um, uh, we argue that if it's not going to be meaningful and useful, you can't really expect volunteers to keep giving, to keep giving their their time. So in terms of diligence, yes, we look at key documents, including um, the scheme of delegation. But let me just say a little bit more about meaningful local governance. And I know some of you will be governing in single schools. So I am going to um, do this very um, briefly, but all the resources are there for those of you who are um, governing trusts. Oh, and I ought to have said um, that if you are governing at an academy level within a trust and you're thinking, oh, that means I can't apply for my board. That's true. But what you do is suggest that your um, trust applies as a whole, or indeed, um, you could put in that, that application. And we have had um, successful finalists through that, through that route, where we were first approached by a local governor, um, who then in fact brought the, the whole trust um, uh, application uh, 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 with them. So um, just to remind you that last year's school's white paper said that all trusts should have local governance arrangements and be responsive to their communities and to their stakeholders. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, you're very out of date, Emma. That was last March and various things have happened since. Yes, we have had a school's bill hit the buffers, but actually this part of the white paper um, still uh, is relevant. Um, so that is not going to go anywhere um, uh, soon. 
soon. As I say, I think people have now come behind um, the uh, structure of, of local governance. So we know because of our work with you all that local governors within trusts tend to cover what we're now calling the four S's, standards, stakeholders, safeguarding and send, as well as being sort of advocates for their, for their school in the same way that any um, uh, governor um, would be. Sometimes there's more delegated and we are not looking in, the, in, in terms of what is outstanding for a particular set of delegations. That is up to you and your trust. What we're looking at is do people govern well within those um, uh, delegations? But we have set out um, uh, expectations of what we think, and this would be good local governance um, uh, uh, looks like uh, in that blog last year. And we are now working on, or the team is working on, I should say, um, some case studies to really exemplify what this looks like in, in practice. We're having so many conversations about meaningful local governance, sort of, you know, every, every day of the week, so many trusts are looking at this and seeing whether they could do um, they could do it better. I'm not going to read um, each of those. They'll be there on the slides for you, but also um, in Sam Henson's um, uh, blog. So again, I wouldn't want you to prevent putting yourself forward because you don't necessarily think that you have got all of these, you know, to perfection. And again, this is not a a tick list. Um, the the richness comes through when we actually um, talk to you uh, at the um, interview interview stage. But you can see, I hope that our standards are very much um, reinforcing those elements of good good governance about accountability, about visibility, but also respect respectful, trusting relationships. Some of you may remember that one of our eight elements of effective governance is about how you um, uh, form respectful, uh, valued relationships. And that's between the board, it's between the board and leaders, but within a mat, it's also between those governing at local level and those governing at, at trust trust board um, level. So the, the principles um, are, are the same. So let me now, in the last few minutes, move on to those final uh, two areas. We seem to be collecting an awful lot of um, numeric lists. So here we've got five um, S's. These were developed by someone called Julia Unwin. Uh, who has done a number of important roles within the voluntary sector, but one of them was a as a charity commissioner um, a while ago, and that's when she developed um, these. They are um, uh, just a slightly different way of looking at um, what NGAs developed in terms of our um, uh, good governance um, and, and eight elements of effective governance. They're just a slightly different way of expressing it. And I always find that really useful to see somebody else's visuals, somebody else's vocabulary. Um, people say things in slightly different ways with slightly different tones. And it's just a good, I find it a good check um, on what I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that, that whole point about we don't want to all get into group think. We try and practice that as NGA as well, challenging ourselves from different Different places. So I um, uh, update the chair's handbook every two years. And last summer, I made sure uh, there wasn't any literature in the in the third sector and others um, that, that that we weren't aware of and and drawing from. So there's a little bit more um, in the chair's handbook um, on this. But she came up with five different modes. If you are a high performing board, you should be supporting your leaders enabling them to do their work. You have a stewardship role, and that means protecting and conserving the assets, the money, the resources, but also the good name for, and I like her phrase, for beneficiaries of tomorrow as well as um, uh, today. You know, you as the board are the guardian of the organization. You know, leaders will come and go, but the entity of the board um, absolutely stays put. 
actually, I probably should have said that right at the beginning. There are some other awards for um, uh, individual volunteers um, and another for governance professionals, but there's absolutely no award anywhere else in the schools and trust sector for governing boards. And we, you know, it's it's the collective of you, isn't it? The team that is so important. It's functioning well as a group. All the legal responsibilities, accountabilities, they're there with you you as a group so that's absolutely something um, the, that we look at um, when when we um, interview uh, you uh, scrutiny again is a word we use we do use um, uh, sometimes so you know, making sure we're both scrutinizing proposals but then examining the process are we getting the right outcomes doing that monitoring Strategy, we're very familiar with as our first core function, making those decisions about that future direction and the priorities. But all that process that goes with that, you know, you don't just arrive and make a decision, do you? There's a lot of thought, learning, discussion that, that goes into that first. But then that last one of stretch, um, questioning how we can do do better coming up with 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 ideas um you you may know i also talk about the three modes of of governance the fiduciary which is more about stewardship the strategic and then the generative having those ideas being able to to really look at possibly doing things differently and it may come it may come to nothing but you want to be looking at um uh ways of 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 doing things potentially differently um and that's how you do that um and making the time to to do that we absolutely think an outstanding governing board would be doing as a board you can't be doing all those five things at the same time um that wouldn't be realistic and we'd all be pulled in five five different directions depending where your board is or more importantly where your organization is you will have to sometimes spend more time on one of those than another and sometimes there might be slight slight tensions but it's a really good reminder that you know, are you getting all of those into the way that that your board um, uh, works? So lastly, governance culture, you may remember in that good governance graphic that one of the real bedrocks um, of good governance is the mission, the culture. Um, and the behaviours. Uh, and this is very much at two levels, really, for governing boards, isn't it? It's about the governance culture um, itself, the behaviours um, in the boardroom. Are you making the best possible decisions? So remember what governance is all about. It's all about who has the power, who makes the decisions, how other people's voices are heard and how account is rendered. So really, you as a board, one of your primary jobs is to make decisions. So an outstanding board does that really well. And that's based on a sort of sequence, well, not always a sequence, but a, but a, but a, a number um, of different layers. One is, you know, have you got good information? Um, uh, do you um, triangulate, dreadful word, but are you getting information from sources other than um, your, your senior leaders, your executives? But once you've come, having read that information into the meeting, um, what do those meetings feel like? You know, what if we were observing that, what would the sort of flow and bounce of the conversation be around the room? Who does the talking? Um, uh, who's in charge and I'm really conscious that I haven't talked about chairs um, uh, at all. Well, technically, yes, the chair's in charge, but actually we would expect everyone in the room to be supporting the, the healthy culture, to be playing their part and making sure that that conversation is, is rich and that it's not only a few people who are listened to. Because we all know that in some cases, somebody has a lot of presence, sometimes because of their role as chair or vice chair or, or head or executive, um, but sometimes not uh, because of, of, of personality and, and, and experience. So maybe making sure that everybody is participating, everybody's contributing. Um, uh, that's really important. Um, but also that the 
group can deal with differences of opinion. Actually, sometimes a little bit of conflict is no bad thing, but it's it's conflict done with respect, um, not hostility. And I think we all know, we all can feel when debate moves from that positive difference of ideas into um, a, a hostile environment. Um, so that's one that as a, as a board, uh, well, whether you're good at whatever you label you would put on on yourself does need to um, engage with sometimes you want to make sure that it's constructive challenge confident principle proportionate um, uh, uh, challenge but also that there are um, independent thinkers there people who will question assumptions question what might be called an established orthodoxy but something that I find really useful is a reminder that actually you're not trying to win an argument. You're helping the board to deliberate. And that's one that's really useful for me because in the household that I was brought up, we loved an argument. One of my brothers became a barrister. It was it was that, that sort of debate. And you don't always want to be conducting governing board um, meetings in, in that um, uh, spirit. And lastly, what are you achieving um, in your in your meetings when you get to the end? Do you all feel that actually you have made good decisions, that you had the time um, uh, uh, to do to do that? You know, sometimes actually moving it on to another point is not necessarily a, 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 a bad thing as long as it's not sort of dithering and, and procrastination. But I would think that an outstanding board would be at the end of each meeting reviewing how those discussions went and thinking, have we actually made a difference to our pupils? Because that's what you're there for, um, isn't it? So just a last word on then not just the culture within your own board, which is often not necessarily behind closed doors, but it's um, it's, it's not that uh, openness um, from from across the organisation. So this is something that we will be asking you about. And I think all outstanding boards will absolutely concern them with themselves with the culture. How do things get done around here? How do things feel here? And some of you may be aware of that expression that um, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, actually, uh, it goes on to, to talk about how you align your strategy and your culture. It doesn't mean you ditch your strategy. It makes sure that those two absolutely um, work together. So there I've quoted the DFE in their governance handbook about um, what they're expecting in terms of boards cultivating um, and safeguarding is their word, which is a good, a good one, I think, that ethos of high expectations of everyone. And that is, you know, in the community. Um, so that is from the board to through the leadership and the staff and, of course, um, for for pupils um, themselves. So one of the things we'd be asking you to reflect on is how have you helped ensure or develop that culture across your organisation? Um, you know, there's a number of, of examples there. You don't need to have, you know, immediately done done something on on all of this. It it may be that you decided as a priority you particularly wanted to look at staff workload and well-being. How did you go about making um, making that that difference? Um, and I can only um, uh, reiterate that the stories that we hear um, are absolutely wonderful about how people have done that. The imagination that they've used. The um, passion that people have to make to make a difference so I, it sort of goes without saying that commitment um, absolutely is expected of an outstanding governance 
uh, governing board but you know that comes through so much in all the work we do um, with you in all the ways that you know we function as as an organization including our our professional um, development so I just wanted to entice you in with a few photographs from the ceremony that we that we hold um, each uh, September in the House of Commons um, and we, we 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 pray for sunshine and I think we've we've always um always had it so it's a great it's a great venue and it's a really good um uh day of of celebration and then we do encourage um our uh our winners to write for us whether it's blogs or or in the in the magazine Again, another of the things that I, I am really taking um, as read is that an outstanding governing board will be um, interested in its development um, as well. It's all part of that, isn't it? Re review and improve. Prove. So I just wanted to flash in front of you um, our leading governance offers, which have recently expanded. We um, have, have for many years had programs for chairs and for um, clerks and governance professionals. Um, but now we also have the separate development program for format um, trustees. So thank you um, very much for joining me uh, today. If you do want any uh, specific information um, about uh, the awards, there is a direct email address there. And um, next month, uh, our webinar is about those other two categories that I haven't talked about, um, excelling as a governance professional. So thank you um, very much and please do um, spread the word. Um, the awards are open um, for some weeks to come. Thank you very much.